speaking to you live and very much alive once again. My name is Stepan Prokorenko, and today I have the honor of speaking to Alberto Mastretta, the artist and co-founder at Original Fire Games, developers of Circuit Superstars. Hello, Alberto. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you um, very much for joining us today. So, yeah, as Stepan said, um, my name is Alberto. I'm one of the founders of Original Fire Games. Um, we're a five-person team with the ambitious goal to create beautiful racing games. And our first game is Circuit Superstars, which I'm about to show you how we use Houdini to uh, speed up our workflow and vastly enhance what we could do as a small team. Right. So I would like to remind everyone that uh, we're taking questions for Alberto during this uh, presentation. So Alberto will now present his screen and... Uh, share some tips on using Goudini as part of a small team or something like that. If you have a question that you would like him to cover at the end of this session, please share it in the chat and uh, we'll pick it up and cover as many questions as possible during uh, this uh, Q&A section. Right now I will disappear and Alberto will share his wisdom. Okay. So today, I'll, I'd like to take you a bit on a tour of how we use Houdini to create tracks like this. So there's quite a few assets uh, that I'm going to have to run through. And I'll, I'm going to have to do it quick uh, on each one, so I won't dive into the details of each one. But I will try to make an explanation of how they were built and, and why they were so useful for us. So this is a, a finished scene, and I prepared a scene here that is not complete, it's, it's an in-progress track. Um, so we'll be able to see uh, sort of from beginning to end what it could look like to work with Houdini um, once you have a pipeline that you've set up. So before I start, I do wanna um, elaborate a little bit on, on the problem that we had and how Houdini was helpful for us. Um, so. We're working in Unity. Um, we had a small team that at any given moment, uh, we were one or two artists working on the on the tracks. So we had to make sure that we could iterate quickly on the um, on the design of the tracks. But we also didn't have a lot of time to do multiple passes of design and art and um, have a, um, a pipeline that was multi-step. So we try to condense everything into design and final art are one thing. And because we're targeting Nintendo Switch, it also needed to be extremely performant and it needed to be able to be baked. So all of the assets that I'm about to show you have light maps that we don't touch manually. It's all automated uh, with the process of each HDA, uh, which is the, the Houdini digital asset um, that we use. So we first start with uh, a terrain and then as one would expect, we we go ahead and start with a track. Uh, this is one of the tools we used. Um, it's very simple. It just matches um, the ground underneath and creates. Where did I go? Creates the sidelines that that you can see here. It's quite tweakable. You can control a bunch of the parameters that it has. Um, you can adjust the width. Um, and also change the amount of um, columns that it has, the resolution, and this is all UV map, which is the best part of it. Uh, so once we have that, we end up with a layout that we can use to start placing and, and testing uh, how the track is, behave is feeling and try and come up with the best layout possible that we can. Now, another thing that is really useful uh, for us has been the curve tool. So we have a bunch of curves here. Um, placing this um, automatically is not something we wanted because there's very particular scenarios in which you want curves or not, depending on, on the track designer's idea of how they want to drive this, this track. So because curves allow for different paths to be taken and they also can restrict them depending on the shape, it's very important that we can iterate on them and make them quickly. So the way we went about it was 
that we made a, a tool that would automatically generate this this surface for us and the very useful part of this is that this is not just about placing it in the world but also controlling um, the way it is designed so if we wanted a, a, a bigger one we could always make it or we can control the, the width we can control the height um, we control the how how steep it is, and this all changes the gameplay quite drastically. And then, because laying down curves manually would be very inconvenient, what we did is that we map we magnetize it to the track. So the way we do so is we give it a a, a mesh to reference, and then the tool will find the border edges of that mesh, and it'll snap to it. So here's how that looks and now i can just place it in the ballpark of where i want it i don't need to be very accurate and it'll still uh, contour the track very well so this was one of the most useful um, tools we had in our arsenal to come up with gameplay um, and really be able to fine-tune how the track was behaving under the cars another goal that we had for our style is that we wanted the, the, the game to have a very distinct and readable look from top down. So we didn't do any uh, splat maps for terrain. We decided to do everything with meshes so that it could be extremely readable. And it also has a different aesthetic that we think is unique and we enjoy uh, having, having it in our game. So the way we did that was with these ground patches, which we can control how, how bumpy they get, and they also get a gradient from the sides. This is all uh, placed in vertex data. So this allowed us to control the color palette quite flexibly and be able to lay down very fast uh, all the different parts that we wanted grass in, or even uh, things like sand as well. So in this case, um, around the a corner, there would be a scenario where the players would want. Um, ooh, I think I I flipped it, but yeah. Let's do this. Ah, there we go. So this is how we would very quickly come up with. Um, different colors on the track that would represent different surfaces and start to really dress up the track and create this motorsporty feel of sand traps, for example. Um, and this was very quick for us. It's not perfectly like automated. It doesn't happen on its own, but it gives us all the control we need. And we love it for being like that. Another thing that is key to racetracks is Having a very easy way to do all these walls, all these fences and, and barriers, because uh, all these motorsport tracks have them. And it's also a very key part of the risk on a track, how close you get to the walls. So having very manual control of how we went about this um, is what we wanted. And this tool that we made um, has a, tr a few tricks that we're really proud of. Um, so I'm going to show you how that looks like. Um, so first, the tool is very agnostic to what you're doing. So it's not, this, in this case, we have arm cuts here, but you could have just a couple of spheres and a cylinder, and then decide that you want to extrude that. And you would get this. So this will take any mesh you want and then just extrude it in that shape. Uh, which is quite magical for us. It will just uh, update very quickly and it allows us to also iterate on how the uh, barriers look from afar. It's better to look at gameplay because our game, uh, it's very easy to get too close to the details, but then we, ha we have to play it and we realize, oh, they're, they're not uh, readable from that distance. So having this flexibility to very quickly update how things look that's fantastic. And this is really 
uh, some of the most powerful techniques we use this, uh, having those interconnected uh, systems that one generates barriers, the other one can generate the profile of the barrier. And then with those two combined, you can very quickly dress up a level just how you want it. Um, so I thought I would show you how that tool eventually is used by placing a little barrier here. And I'm going to have to recook it, but once it's done. Oh, it may have lost the reference. Mm -hmm. Oh, bubble. Here you go. Sometimes those things do happen, um, but they're very easy to just fix and keep working. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm not. I'm gonna skip the. Oh, you know what? It's it's close enough. I'm gonna do the post as well, just so that it looks complete. And there we go. Got the full arm barrier. Um, this is all UV mapped. It has light maps. You can bake it. Uh, it ha also has a collision mesh that is simplified. It's got a bunch of things already set up. And yeah, we use it extensively. We also have different types of object barriers. Uh, so these are not sweep. They're not extruding anything. They're just instancing. Uh, so a, a different premise, but also used ex um, throughout the game uh, in many different circumstances. So the way we do that is um, we can, it's similar. We can also have um, an object that we can uh, give it. So in this case, we can do a tire barrier, a tire barrier, barrier stack. Uh, we can change the stack. Let's see. Ooh. So we can do that. And then once we're happy, we can send it to the barrier um, to start generating this uh, very quickly. Where am I? Oh, I'm updating the sweep one. So we have one here. Now lay down. Uh, so in this one, I'm going to show you exactly how um, it works. So we can go to the pile, pile generator and change the, the amount of wheels that it has, and it'll automatically update on the tool. Um, and on the tool itself, which, where is it? On the tool itself, we can also change the colors. So we can say we want the four different colors. Um, we can do it um, like so, and then change the pattern. I'm gonna go with four. Um, because this is an object-based one, we can also choose to uh, stack them at different distances and that's how we space them out just the way we want them, color them, and end up with a tire barrier that also is all UV mapped. Um, and it has a collision mesh, as you can see, is doing all of that for us. And we only had to create two, two tools for this, just one um, model creator, let's say. You could also model this out in Maya if you want it. Uh, we chose to make it an HDA as well, so that we could iterate on the thickness and the the final look on the on the track. It's easier to to see it here in Houdini, sorry, in Unity, and adjust it rather than making the model in Maya 
uh, or any other 3D software and go back and forth. It's really flexible if we, you can do it here on the fly. And so once they are created, um, we build this. Once they're created, it's easy. Just we want them. So we're making a little corner here, corner of a racetrack uh, by using all these assets. So you can see it's not taking too long to start dressing all this corner of the of the of the game uh, with the color palette that we want, and it's very easy to change the color palette as you saw. If we choose that this track is going to be blue instead, we can very quickly update all of this. Uh, we also have other types of barriers. This is like alternating alternating objects. So this one, similar to this uh, barrier one, but more uh, of a pattern. So in this case, we have uh, a tube and then a plank, and we'll arc alternating between the posts and the, and the horizontal planks. And we also are giving it distinct ones. So if you see, they're not all the same. Uh, they're changing in shape. Uh, so for this tool, we have quite a bit of flexibility. We can give it different planks, uh, and also we can give it different posts. In this case, I just gave it one type of post and different types of planks. And yeah, it allows us to also very quickly start to set dress tracks. Actually, sometimes the um, the colliders get rendered for some reason, but it's very easy to fix with a rebake. Um, so these are all the basic core uh, track tools that we use are different types of barriers, curbs, um, grass, and paths. Um, beyond that, we have uh, also another, another key one is fences. So, Catch fences are important in motorsport. They protect the crowd. They protect the racers as well from going into gnarly places. So having a quick way to generate these things uh, what's important for us. And if you think about it, it's very similar to this one. It's You need to extrude uh, a mesh and then instantiate some posts. But in this case, we did it as a separate HDA. It has its own unique properties. Uh, so I'm going to show you how that looks like and why we did it as a, as its own HDA. It's not um, it's not exactly just extruding. It's also making sure that this uh, can be controlled. The the UV on this one can be controlled manu manually so that we can change the scale of the pattern as well as changing the properties on the length. So if we want the top to be longer. We can do so. So we can control uh, the shape very easily. We can control the angle. Um, so in case it's obstructing the the visuals, we can bend it down a little. We can also uh, change the way the tubes are made. We can pack and instance them. So this changes the way they're rendered from being like a full mesh that is all merged together to instances. Um, we can also add these little knobs at the end that make it look a little bit more finished. We quite like that. And just as easily as the previous um, HDH that I showed you, it's extremely easy to, to use once you set all this up. That's a bit of a weird solution I left, but we're going to leave it like that. Uh, so that I can keep covering more assets. So because we have such a segmented art style, uh, everything is like in a piece of its own, so are our clips. So <laughs> we made this cliff tool. Um, the cliff tool is one that we really like to sort of block out the, the outside of the tracks. 
it really helps us um, sort of give a finished finishing touch to the tracks when we're uh, running out of road, let's say, and we don't want to decorate too far. We can block it out by using this clips. And the clips have um, quite a few things to tinker with. So we have, mm -mm -mm. what do we have? Oh, the cliff noise. So we can control the, the noise. Uh, so we can make it look more rocky um, if we want. Uh, depending on the track, we may change the type of noise we're using. So you can also choose different types of noise. Um, vertex color. So we're not texturing any of this. This is mostly just using world space texturing and vertex colors. And that's how we so quickly can change the color palette, change the look of things. And we're not going into Photoshop. We're not even going to Substance for any of these things. We're not bringing them into external software. We're directly getting a final mesh that we like here in Unity. And we can hit play at any moment. And it'll work just fine. So if we wanted to use that clip, we can just play with it. And usually it takes like a couple of refreshes to, to bake once when you reopen a scene. But once you open a scene and play with it, all these HDAs work flawlessly. It's just the first time that you open them. You may need like a couple of refreshes. OK, so that's sort of the core of things that are very directly on the ground. Um, and now I'd like to show you some of the props we use. So one thing that is very present on racetracks are grandstands. So these ones we didn't do um, manual. Uh, we didn't do procedurally. These are generated. You could make them procedural and bend them if you want. But in our case, we felt um, this is the type of uh, mesh that we could author manually, but we can we have a few tricks that we use around them uh, that we quite like. So we've got these decorators uh, called ooh, there are hanging flags. So all this um, is generated by Houdini. The the wing properties are being baked into the UVs of the mesh. And it is gradually giving different properties to different parts of the mesh. So for example, um, the waving motion of the wind is mapped uh, at 0% uh, percent here and 1 here. So we can gradually um, calculate the, the fall of, of, of where we want the wind to affect this mesh. And this tool is quite fun to use. Um, it was also one of the most fun to make. And once we have it, we can do quite a few things. So this is a different use of that tool. Um, this is called Papel Picado here in Mexico. You may have seen it in like Dia de Muertos uh, celebrations. And the way you can do all of this is by just um, adding points. So if I add a point, A, a different uh, step. And like so, we can very quickly start to decorate with this if we want to. We love using this tool. Um, I like that it automatically takes care of the wind for us and it looks so natural is impressive. And we only really needed to calculate the distance between this point and this point, and then make a gradient and store that in the UV data, uh, and then use that UV data in the in the shader to move this. And the reason why we used it in the UV data and not the vertex uh, colors, because often wind is mapped to vertex colors, uh, like in trees, for example, was because we wanted the vertex colors to control 
the pattern. Uh, so we can change the colors of this if we want. Oh, I didn't click on the, didn't click on this. Change the colors, let's make it green. There we go. So that's a really fun tool. Um, then we've got another uh, wind affected mesh that we made. So this one, this one is not an HDA in Unity. Uh, we entirely modeled this in Houdini, which was very uh, convenient to model it there because it could give us these gradients uh, by proximity. We could paint the mesh um, by using procedural um, nodes to measure the proximity to the to different parts of, a, of, of the mesh. So we put some spheres here to sort of lock down uh, the wind on these portions. And then when it when it waves, it's getting pinned there. Uh, it's not gonna move. Uh, but the rest of it is it's being uh, affected by wind. And we, we did that just by using a node um, that can measure the proximity and transfer that proximity into a property. That property was color. So we painted black anything that was near um, three points here or this entire tube. Um, so we, we've got flags and we've got hanging flags. We can combine them and start to decorate. <laughs> like so. Really fun. I, I love the, using the, the flags in Circuit Superstars. We also had to come up with different sponsors. So sponsors, they're different shapes in different parts of the track. We may want them smaller, taller. Um, so we were able to do all of that by making an HDA and very quickly changing all the properties. Uh, so this is a procedural model. Uh, which means that if we ever want a different type of sponsor, we can just generate it here, um, come up with a shape. If we want it square, uh, we just need to um, change here like until it's square. And then now we have a completely different mesh. This is, again, all this is UV mapped. Uh, all this has vertex colors as well. Um, so you can you can texture it in substance if you want. We can also use vertex colors directly as we very often do. And most importantly, it's light mapped. So if we want to bake the track, this is light mapped already. Uh, so we don't ever look at UVs when we're uh, making sponsorship sponsor signs. Another one we did, which I don't have a, an example for this track because it, this is sort of like a building uh, HDA, but if you had a building and you wanted to fill it with leaves, um, really pretty, uh, we, had a, we have an Ivy Leaf generator. So this one <laughs> I love using. Um, you, can, you just specify what you want it to surround and then recook it and it'll populate whatever you're indicating it to populate. So uh, the way we did that was we would have a, a building and then we would manually uh, outline a mesh with Pro, uh, Pro Builder. We would use Unity's Pro Builder uh, to sort of indicate where we want the leaves to go. And then we would pass that mesh to these. Um, and then suddenly you have um, very beautiful foliage around the building. Um, I love using that one. Another uh, great way to use Houdini for us was nature. So let's let's show some of the nature we have. When it comes to making trees, um, the biggest thing for us was how do we make a distinct silhouette? We were really focusing on just trying to come up 
with a silhouette that when you looked at it from the side, uh, it represented the tree that you had in mind. So it could be tall, it could be it could be wide, and we didn't really want to have to meddle with uh, too many properties. We just wanted to get the shape the way we want it, and very quickly uh, get a tree out of it. So if I recook this, uh, you see that it'll adapt to that silhouette that I, that I was uh, generating. So if I want this tree to be tall, now I have a tall tree. And because it's a top-down game, uh, we didn't really need the leaves to be pointing in lots of different directions. We just needed them to be pointing up. Uh, so you'll see that there you can't see them from below, and this isn't a very effective tree to re be rendered in a game where you have the camera lower to the ground. But in our case, this was very effective. Again, all UV mapped, uh, all these different, um, all these different triangles. Uh, mostly, they're just quads are being uh, laid down, and you can actually inspect the mesh if you if you really want to, and see uh, the UV layout for channel one. There we go. That's that's the UV map. This is the UV map for channel for channel zero, which is the one getting the texture. This is all pretty automatic for us. <laughs> Another thing that was important for this was that uh, we do want the, the leaves to point sort of uh, inwards so that mm, if you look at them from different angles, it still is uh, looking like it's rounding out. Um, and so there's, there's a, a ton of things here uh, happening. Uh, with the normals and so on, but the one I wanted to show you was um, the one the the part that controls how the leaves are oriented. Let's see. Centroid. So if I put the centroid at zero, uh, all the leaves point to the center of the mesh. So as I start to make it downwards, the leaves are going to start to orient themselves to face that direction. So we're going to start to face up more because they're actually looking down. Oh, <laughs> did I do? Did I? What's it? Minus five? I think I lost the minus there. So you can see. Very quickly, we can orient the leaves just the way we want. And if we want the tree to, to have, if you see here, we're getting very shallow angle for those. So we may want to go higher uh, and they'll look more flat. And now, once we had that, we would just pair it up with a trunk that we would model. Uh, you can model these in Houdini. There's lots of ways to, to make trees in Houdini. This is just the way we did it. And you would combine it with this, and then you have a tree. And then once we had that, we would mostly just uh, turn, it on, turn that into a prefab. And then we would use our next um, nature tool, which was our scatter tool. So we didn't want to manually place all these things around the track. So what we did is we just made a scattering tool where we define an area where we want vegetation to be. And we can put all types of vegetation here. Um, right now, I just gave it uh, four different trees, which actually, in this case, it could have been one. They all look <laughs> very similar. Uh, but if you put a pine tree, it'll look very different, right? Um, and then with the scatter tool, we can control the coverage. So it gives us a lot of control on how we want uh, this section of the of the track to be um, populated by these trees. Um, it's also easy to test if your performance is sunken, maybe you just go in and adjust the slider. 
but arteries are actually very performant and mm -hmm. in Unity's URP, it's not an issue. Okay, so I, the last one that I wanted to show you was our tree creator, which is a different type of tree creator. This one uh, is, instead of making leaves, this one makes a full tree, uh, but it really only works for uh, trees that don't have like a canopy, but more, um, well, I don't know if canopy is the right word, but they don't have like a volume, but rather they have an extrusion. So for all of these, we just tweaked a few settings and we have a line here that we can use to change the height. And this is how we made lots of different trees. Um, and we could control lots of settings here uh, to make them uh, thicker on the top, like this one that shrinks to the bottom. So the reason why I like using Houdini instead of a tool like SpeedTree uh, because with this one, we had very, very direct control of performance and our shaders. So if we wanted to have a specific feature, we could do so. And Unity gives us all, sorry, Houdini gives us all the control we need to make the tools work exactly the way we want them. Okay, so that concludes the tour of the HDAs that we built. So what I wanted to do uh, sort of as a conclusion was, now that I've shown you how we used it, I would like to um, sort of put a bit of background into how long th all this took and how feasible it is uh, if you're a small indie dev that you could take advantage of these tools. Um, so at, as I said in the beginning, we only have about two artist tops uh, working on tracks at any given time. So. We had really limited uh, resources to spend um, time on by looking into different solutions. And we had a, about a two month window to come up with a pipeline because we were running out of time. <laughs> so all of the tools uh, that you see here were made in under two months, uh, starting from scratch. So uh, I had previously zero knowledge of Houdini. Um, and I came across a fantastic tutorial by Kenny Lammers, or also known as uh, IndiePixel, uh, for making racetracks. And it covered about 80% of the knowledge that I needed to get all these tools in place. The rest of the knowledge I found around the, the Houdini learning site. And I spent about one month learning Houdini. So I had no experience and then just watched tutorials for a full month of development I did not contribute to the project uh, during that month, I was just learning. But once I did so, uh, I spent another month making this pipeline uh, that vastly changed the premise uh, of our game. And it allows us to meet the ambitious goal that we had of creating all of these tracks in, in the aesthetic that we wanted and in the performance that we wanted. So this runs at 60 frames on Nintendo Switch. And as I said, yeah, it was only two months, one of learning and one of implementing all the tools. And plus some days that I would spend here and there fixing the tools because um, while we were using them, we were we would find issues with them. Uh, oh, this one is not doing the UV maps correctly. I would go back and fix them. But really it was under three, under three months for the duration of the project spent in Houdini. And mostly, I would say, two months plus a few days here and there for maintenance. Uh, so if you're a small studio and feel like you could enhance your uh, pipeline, I would strongly recommend that you slow down and learn anything you need in order to get to do so, because the advantages of making better tools are immeasurable. So the way we went about that was Houdini. I think Houdini is a... To, it's extremely convenient uh, for making these type of things. You could, of course, make your own in Unity and C Sharp. It would probably run a lot uh, more snappy, but you would take so much longer to make them because they have such a robust toolset for making this type of things. Um, so I would strongly encourage any indie teams that are making 3D worlds to 
give Houdini a look, uh, see if they it works for them. But yeah, I I am very happy that we chose to use it because otherwise I don't think we could have made this game. So that concludes the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alberta. I will not pretend that I understand like more than 30% of what you've said, but it did sound very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, let me start from this. Uh, judging from our chat, Circuit Superstars mm -hmm. has a very passionate community. And mm. one of the things that they're very passionate about is creating new tracks. So as I understand, Circuit Superstars does not have a track editor right now. No. And um, what I want to ask you is, uh, like, can people use um, tools like Houdini and Unity to build race tracks themselves for the game, as asked by MPH26? So it is a thing that would be possible. Uh, it would need a lot of infrastructure. We have an online game, so distributing those... Um, materials would be difficult to make it work. Um, we don't have a modding uh, interface or we don't have modding capabilities in the game at the moment, but we do want to explore the possibility of making our tools available um, so that one day uh, we can extend all this tool set to our community and make a game where people can contribute uh, to, the, to the racetracks that the game features. So that's, that's our future goal. I don't think we will make it for Secret Superstars 1, but it is possible that, and it's something we're exploring for future projects. Right. And like theoretically, um, tools like Houdini specifically, do they help uh, when it comes to stuff like track editors and mm -hmm. giving community tools to build uh, tracks for a game or you know, levels for a game? I'm sorry, what was the question? I mean, if you're building the game with Houdini, uh, mm -hmm. will it impact in the future if you decide to give the community tools like track editor or level editor? Does it impact it at all? Uh, so it make it easier or harder? Houdini, Houdini doesn't ship uh, with a runtime version. So any Houdini code that is in Unity gets stripped out of the game when we build it. So there's no way currently to have an in-game editor, but what would be possible is to download Unity, download Houdini, right. and download the set of tools, and then um, come up with a way where we can package those things, export them, and for our games to recognize that as game levels. Um, uh, the other alternative is to not use Houdini at all and just um, make all these tools manually, but it takes an extreme amount of labor for, uh, to do so. So uh, it, that's why it's, uh, it's either using Houdini and, and Houdini and exporting that or making an in-game tool that is made uh, probably in C-sharp. I don't know if Houdini has plans to um, include any of the Houdini operations in a runtime environment, but that would be terrific. If they could do so. Oh, I know that uh, we have Ben from Houdini listening to us live, and maybe if he wants to answer that question in the chat, uh, he's welcome to. Uh, but we have another question. So, Minority Simsport is asking mm. uh, whether sponsors could be changed, exchanged in real time, or ha it has to be done beforehand because uh, those assets needs to be and those assets needs to be baked first mm, so it would be possible uh, what we would need to do is point the texture to a server uh, to a, an environment like playfab which is what we use and then pull a texture from there so it, it would be possible it's not something we did at the moment but mm -hmm. it would be possible to uh, make instead of making the material uh, just grab a texture that is in Unity, you make it grab a texture from the internet and then load it dynamically. And it, there would be some, because of the Circuit Superstars is baked lighting, there would be some mismatch, but it would be ne negligible. And I don't think it would deter from the visual fidelity uh, enough to not do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, another question from, um, let's do Stony this time. Uh, have you had to decrease the amount of foliage for the Switch release? No. Uh, so the foliage, what we did have to do was we usually, we previously had two different shaders, one which was double-sided. You would see leaves from one side and the other. And then we had a shader that was only single-sided. It was more effective to just use a single-sided shader and duplicate the geometry on the trees that were using double-sided. So we did change the geometry so that we could use a single shader all throughout the game. And that was more performant as well. So uh, that was the only real change. We didn't have to reduce the amount of foliage in the game for Switch. Okay, before just we, yeah, before we mm -hmm. proceed to other questions about Houdini, let's do one more from the passionate community of Circuit Superstars. <laughs> Shirodi Buck is asking uh, whether you guys are planning to release slightly longer straights for the next circuits. Slightly longer straights? Uh, yeah, um, we do have a limit on the size of the world because um, the texture that we use to paint those the tire marks on the ground um, gets blurrier and blurrier the more you grow it. And we can only go, uh, we can't change the resolution on that because it has performance impacts. Uh, so we try to keep the worlds under 200 meters square, which is very small. Um, but I think we could push it uh, just like 225. Uh, otherwise, it, it starts to get blurry and we lose some visual fidelity. Um, but yeah, it would be possible. <laughs> Perhaps in the future. Um, well, let's go back to Houdini. Is it possible to use Houdini as part of a procedural level generation, for example, for creating buildings or creating roads in real time? Yeah, um, there's amazing resources online on how to do so. Um, as I said, we spent one month learning Houdini, uh, and that was just me. So we, I didn't get to learn all the all the magic that Houdini allows for. Um, I didn't even get to show all the tools we did. <laughs> we did more uh, for for rocks, for example. Uh, but buildings is one of the biggest ones because. Um, the, for the next project, I plan on spending more time learning Houdini again uh, so that we can leverage those possibilities for making, for example, automated uh, roads for a city and buildings, uh, which I've seen the examples of what Houdini is putting out and like the Matrix demo, for example, is incredible. And for us, if we could just uh, paint some lines on the ground and get the roads to to follow that path and then get buildings scattered between the blocks of those roads uh, with a specific aesthetic. That's the goal for us uh, for the next project. Um, and we want to do so with um, with those capabilities of procedural buildings and procedural roads. So it is entirely possible. And you could even automate all of this even further. So we had plenty of manual control, but there's ways in which you can interconnect HDAs and make them work sort of in an orchestra. So yeah, there's there's so many ways to to take advantage of Houdini that we didn't get to. Uh, but I think what was very um, special about our case was how little time we had uh, to implement all of this and how much mileage we got out of it. Um, and that's, that's what I, I hope other indie devs can take out of it is even if you don't have all the time in the world to learn everything there is to learn, if you just make this one tool that will serve you a month, it'll be it'll be worth it. Okay, uh, let's do another question from Trodebach. Uh, do you think about applying night, day transition and weather effects for the next project, and how would that affect the circuits that you create? Uh, how would I specifically like uh, share some thoughts about using Houdini uh, in night, day circle uh, circuit and uh, weather effects? Weather how it impacts it at all. Yeah, so it would impact, we would have to change our shaders, uh, for example, to to support. Uh, we If we, well, for future project, what we would like to do is um, weather and day night. Um, and that would mean that we can't fully bake lighting, but what we could still leverage the capabilities of light mapping in Unity to do uh, real-time global illumination and still get nice bounce light and ambient light out of it. Uh, so Houdini would still be helping us tremendously 
by those capabilities. And it is entirely possible to do those things. Um, it's just performance um, that gets affected. So there's plenty of work to be done in performance uh, in that regard. And then some neat things like if you if you go nighttime, you either bake light or if you have uh, some dynamic lights, then you gotta use deferred rendering ideally because it it, it is better better for performance when you have many lights. And so there would be differences um, in the project setup for for supporting that type of feature, but it is very much possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of questions, and you touched that already about learning Houdini and how much time it takes. Uh, so, as I understand, to achieve your current skill level, you've spent uh, a month learning Houdini, and then you've applied it during development of Circuit Superstars and kind of learned as a yeah. job. Right? That's right. And like, uh, how much time if you're Let's say if you're a complete novice and this is your first game and you just like you've opened Unity, uh, would mm -hmm. you uh, recommend uh, start like starting to learn Houdini as well, or maybe you should spend some time working without it and just create the first game using the simplest tools possible? Um, so I would say it really depends on the person. Um, I have a background where I was, I'm both an artist and a programmer. I'm not like an elite engineer, but I know my way around code and I'm very familiar with node-based interfaces as well for generating logic. So for, for a person like me, it was a relatively simpler than uh, a person who is either starting out or maybe they're purely an artist. Um, and they have no yet. Uh, they haven't gained experience using log generating logic either by code or uh, through node-based interfaces. So it, it, I think the time that re is required for learning Unity will vary vastly depending on the uh, technic technical background of the person. But yeah, I. It also depends on the project. So. Uh, 2D games, for example, have fantastic tools natively. Um, 3D games have not nearly as many uh, tools to design levels quickly. Like we don't operate in tiles. Uh, there's no tile uh, tools in Unity natively, um, like there is for 2D or splines, for example. So uh, making 3D games is a lot harder uh, due to the lack of uh, tooling. <laughs> I think uh, so. Supplementing that and, and fixing that uh, that problem is is of course extremely valuable. But only if the game requires it. Uh, there's many types of design that don't really need procedural workflows. I, they would benefit most likely. But if you're working with tiles uh, and prefabs and just building a world with that, which is entirely doable, uh, I don't think it's required. But I do think there's a huge benefit in the visual quality that you can aim for if you have better tools. All right. Speaking of prefabs, another question that we had: uh, How can the system, I think that's a Houdini, take advantage of the prefab system found in Unity or other engines with a similar setup? Mm, so, Unity um, can bring in an HDA. Um, Houdini digital asset, and then you can sort of model in, in Unity, test it, and then you can export that model and treat it as a model that you brought from any other software. You can make it a prefab, just like the trees uh, that I showed. Once you are happy with how a mesh looks, you can bake it and turn it into a prefab, and then you work as you would as if you had made the file in Blender or Maya. Um, but you have the flexibility that you can see it in game, play it, and verify that you actually like the proportions, the shape, the colors before you bake that. So I think the benefits on, on certain types of objects um, of making them in Unity with HDAs are huge. Um, mm -hmm. You could, of course, there's there's plenty of ways to work rapidly between Maya and Blender. 
and Unity. Uh, but still, uh, I think the capabilities of having the, the procedural nature in Unity sliding, for example, um, and being being able to directly see the the how it will look in game as you're modeling it is very unique. Right. Well, um, I think uh, that Houdini is a newer tool than, say, Unity or Unreal Engine, specifically mm -hmm. in game development. So, uh, it, from your experience, uh, is there enough learning resources on the internet to get started? And uh, maybe you have a few recommendations for people who want to learn how to use Houdini in games development. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, obviously, Unity has an immense amount of tutorials, but what I think Houdini has is that it, it doesn't have as many, but it has them very well organized in their website. So if you want to learn Houdini, um, of course, you can look on YouTube and you'll find a lot of resources there. But uh, in the in the Houdini website, it's cataloged very, uh, very well. So if you're looking for modeling or procedural modeling, for games, they have a category for that. So you can start learning. And my teacher was in the pixel. Uh, that, that's who I learned most of uh, Houdini from. And yeah, about 80% of the knowledge I, I needed, I got it from his tutorials. And there, there, this very specific tutorial uh, that he has for racetracks was fantastic. But uh, there's other amazing tutorials for buildings, for example. Um, yeah, there's there's so much material to cover. And I, I haven't covered it all. But I do feel there's enough for a person who is putting in the time to feel comfortable with Houdini in a, in a couple of months. Um, I don't think uh, you, would, you will feel blocked by lack of um, knowledge available. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do one more question from Trudy Uh So the objects are created in Circuit Superstars in a way the, where you can see the cars uh, when they're behind. So why the game doesn't have bridges or pedestrian bridges on in the current state? Ah, uh, mostly just for visibility. Um, um, bridges Bridges like where a car can go over a different part of the track, like in a figure eight, like uh, a track like Suzuka, for example. Um, we don't have that solution yet because we use a map for painting. Uh, so you would get you would paint on both the bridge and the under road um, because it's using a single texture. So we we don't have. I mean, it would be a visual visual quality uh, um, problem. It's not really big problem, but it would be there. Um, and yeah, we don't put bridges just because when we tried it, uh, we felt it obstructed a little <clears throat> a little too much. So we just avoided them. Yeah, uh, Ben from Houdini is correcting me and says that Houdini is, uh, has been around for the last 30 years, which is right, but in games development specifically, it is a newer tool. And I think that in the last few years, developers have started to use it much uh, more actively than before. Mm -hmm. Well, before we finish, uh, one of the most complicated questions I have encountered <laughs> in a while uh, from Oliver. GMC or Volkswagen? GMC or Volkswagen? So, and, Oh no, I, I I can't. I would have to be uh, looking at a specific model. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No comment from you. No comment from you. No <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so to every developer who has joined us today, I would like to remind you that if you are from the United Kingdom or Germany, we, as an in Indica, uh, will be having new seasons of the festival this year in the next few months, and Houdini is sponsoring both of them, uh, so the winners of the festival will receive a one-year Houdini license for free. So keep up to date with our news and submit uh, your projects when we open submissions. Well, I would like to thank you, Alberto. Uh, please tell us uh, where we can find you on the interwebs. Uh, you can find us at originalfiregames.com. 
um, or I'm available at Speedy Mastretta uh, on Twitter. Yeah, well, I'll still up. Maybe <laughs> not on the For You page, but <laughs> definitely give Alberto a follow. And uh, I would like to thank you again, Alberto, for joining us today. Thanks uh, to Ben and Houdini for connecting us to Original Fire Games. I hope this uh, was uh, very interesting to developers who have joined us today. Uh, this lecture will stay up on our YouTube channel. And yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks thank you so much. Yeah, see you right. soon.